Well, welcome back to Inside Personal Growth, everybody. Um, I was basically just saying to Richard that uh, I don't know if this is 957 or what it is, but it's been 15 years. Richard and I had a great pre-interview call and talked about some of the old masters in the Mill Valley area, uh, George Leonard and Dan Millman and all the cool people that I've just been so blessed to meet. And now Richard Strozeri Heckler, is that right? Did I get the right, the middle then part? Strozzi. Strozzi, very Italian. Okay. I like pizza, just think pizza, Strozzi. Right. Strozzi, uh, Heckler. And you can find him at his same website, uh, which is strozziinstitute.com, which is a great website for you to learn more about him, about what we're going to be talking about, which is his book called Embodying the Mystery, Somatic Wisdom for Emotional, Energetic, and Spiritual Awakening. And for all of you, there's what the book looks like. And we are going to put a link to Amazon for that. We'll also put a link to the website as well. So Richard, I always like to let our guests know a bit about you. Um, Richard, PhD is the founder of Strozzi Institute. He spent over four decades researching, developing, and teaching somatics to business leaders, executives, managers, teams from Fortune 500 companies, NGOs, technology startups, nonprofits, and U.S. government and military. Uh, he was named one of the top 50 executive coaches in the art of practice of leadership coaching and in profiles in coaching. He's the co-founder of the Mideast Aikido Project, MAP, which brings together Palestinians and Israelis through the practice of Aikido. Boy, that's got to be interesting. Uh, Richard's the author of eight books, including The Leadership Dojo, In Search of the Warrior Spirit, The Anatomy of Change, Holding the Center and the Art for Somatic Coaching, uh, Embodying Skillful Action, Wisdom and Compassion from 2002 to 2007, was the advisor to NATO and the Supreme Allied com Commander of the European Forces there, and formerly the National Security Advisors. Got a PhD in psychology and is a seventh degree black belt in the martial arts of Aikido. Isn't that as high as you can go? Or is there nine? There's, there's, not, there's nine. No. That's what I thought. I thought, yeah, I thought there was nine. It's interesting how, I don't know where I remember that from, but I did. Well, this book for everybody is filled with stories. It's filled with questions. And the questions are contemplative in nature. I love that about that because in every chapter, you'll see them weaved through the chapters. And for that, if you only bought this book just for the questions, you'd be that it would be great because it would really get you thinking about your life. Um, Richard, in your introduction to the book, you write about your grandmother's teachings on the nature of spirit, and it had this profound effect on you. Your grandmother sounded like a fascinating woman, especially doing um, the, uh, which was the readings that she did, uh, sound like a very spiritual woman. Can you speak with us about your early teachings and how you said in the book the heaven you were being pulled to was within you. I thought that was a great statement. Also something taught by your grandmother. Yes, this was the grandmother on my mother's side, my matriarchal grandmother, who came to the U.S. at about 14 or 15 with a few coins in her pocket with her sister, made it to Montana where there was a growing Swedish community there. And she always had um, spiritual slash mystical leanings. And so when I re first started to remember her, um, I would uh, know that she read palms, she read tea leaves to the Swedish community, and she did seances. So every Friday night in this very small apartment we lived in uh, with my mother and my grandmother, my father was out at sea as a, as a Navy warrant officer. And we'd sit around a table with a candle flickering and um, she would put her hands on the table as the rest of the penitents would. And 
there would be these yes or no questions and the table would knock once for no and twice for yes. And so I'm sitting there and I'm just part of it. And what was remarkable for me in it was that it wasn't like anything special. It was kind of like listening to a two-way radio or some communication to somebody you couldn't see. In this case, they were dead and you were talking to them. And um, it really opened up for me, Greg, this notion that in how I assimilated it in my eight-year-old mind was that there's, um, there's another world that maybe we can't see, but it's just as robust and as vital and informative and wise as where we're living now, maybe even wiser. And, uh, you know, we would leave. They would have the Swedish bread, Svenska Bulla, and coffee. And while everybody else in the world watched the Jackie Gleason show, we did seances. Well, I'll tell you, those seances opened up your mind and your consciousness to a different world. And thank God for your grandmother, because um, she was a blessing to you. You can see that by all the work that you're doing and had a huge influence because you tell more uh, stories about here in this book, not just that one, but that was, uh, was a great one. And one of them I'm going to talk to you about now is this one that you had, you know, and, and you say life fastened to death. You tell a very compelling stories, one in which you and your friends, you're out, you know, some of your friends, um, you found this dog. It was a yellow dog, I remember, in the woods that had passed. And you didn't see any trauma with the dog. You didn't see where it had been beaten. You didn't see any of that. And the second, uh, you, the second was in the same realm of stories, what is about the birth of a calf on the ranch in Montana where the heifer died and the cat, calf lived. Um, and again, this is about the death of an animal. And I remember your mom saying, no, don't touch it. You're going to get germs. Um, and your grandmother having a completely different uh, perspective. Um, what did you learn about transformation of life to death from both experiences so early in life? I mean, I think many of us as young kids had stuff like that, an animal dies or a cat or a dog that we have dies. And maybe we don't give it this kind of deep uh, focus and sense, but you seem to have as a result of your upbringing. Um, so talk with us, if you would, about it, because they were great stories. <laughs> yeah, the, um, I'll fill, you, fill everybody in a little bit more about the story with the dog, because, you know, there was nothing untoward about it. Like you said, it didn't look like it was beaten, nor was it old. And um, it was recently dead because there was no putrefaction. But there was, and I was immediately fascinated by, gee, it looks like a dog. It has all the elements of a dog, but something's missing. Now, my young buddy, some threw pebbles at it, some poked it with a stick. And all I could think of it, all I could really think of, and I can't tell you why, but what was missing? Went home told my mother and grandmother about it. Like you said, my mother immediately went into a germ story. You might catch a disease. Yeah. Don't touch it. Promise me you won't go back. And my grandmother said to me when I asked, what was that that was missing? And she said, it's spirit was missing. I said, what is spirit? And she said, spirit is everywhere. It's in the world and it's within us. And it totally captured my imagination. I did go back the next day and petted it and petted it <laughs> and felt it. And I went back successive days. And what I began to see was that it was being colonized by all these spiders and insects and these little things that look like black wiggly apostrophes. And pretty soon it began to capitulate into this stream that, that we it was lying in. Um, crows had taken and its eyes out. And so I began to witness this thing called transformation. And up close, it's and it, it reeked, it had a smell, but it started to fasten itself with this notion of my grandmother said, spirit, spirit is everywhere, spirit is life. 
And at the same time, this form or this shape began to capitulate back into the ground till, you know, a week later, I'd go back and it was almost indistinguishable from the sand and the water and everything that came and had its way with it. You know, yeah, I, I, I obviously, scientists would say the decomposition of the body. In your case, your grandmother was giving you a different perspective about the spirit of this dog, spirit of, you know, even the calf, you know, that, 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 that lived in the heifer that died on the farm when it was pulled out, right? Yeah, eight years later, I'm at the family ranch in Montana. This is the family ranch on the Italian side, my father's family. And I'm helping, um, there's this calf that's having a hard time being birthed. Um, my uncle, um, Sonny, we tied it with ropes. I pulled on it with the horse that I was on. The, the calf came out, the mother, the heifer died. And it was lying there and the calf's on wobbly legs. There's blood on the hard pan. Um, the dogs are starting to look, lick the, the blood. And um, I looked over at my uncle Sonny, who was a rancher, a strong, tough man. And he held up his both hands empty. And he said, ah, shit. Now I knew that a lot of animals had passed by his own hand and by nature. It wasn't the first time he saw that but it just struck him in some kind of a way, you know? So he pulled out a Pall Mall. I don't even know. You if they said have he was a little teary eyed. Well, we had this moment where we wiped it down and then we made contact and he said shit again. And we made eye contact and I could tell he was in a state of emotion. Yeah. And the only emotion I'd ever seen a grown man make was anger. And he was a he was a, a man's man unquote, and he had this emotion in his eyes, and I was drawn towards it, and he saw that, and right away he pulled away, and he embodied in that moment what men of my generation, his generation, learned was that you don't share your emotions with another man. Yeah, we pulled the calf, we pulled the heifer away. So it had the vultures and the coyotes and wolves would have its way with it. And, you know, just like a sharp splinter under my fingernail, I remembered the dog that happened eight years previously. And to me, it was like this moment as an adult, I would say, as I named that chapter, life fastened to death. And how immediately linked they were, they were linked together. And now I think about how the Chinese don't say yin and yang. They say yin yang. And we say living and dying, but it's really living, dying. And that produced in me, you know, this immediate kind of um, attraction and intrigue about what is spirit? What does it mean to be in a human body? What happens when this human body capitulates and leaves like all these animal bodies I was seeing? And it became a through a through thread in my, my investigations around what does it mean to be in a human body? Yeah, it, it certainly um, was, your world was opened up very young. Um, you know, a lot of people don't start reflecting on this until they're in their 60s uh, because they're seeing their, you know, finitude could be not that far away, right? Um, whereas you at a very young age, got exposed to this and you referred to Baba as you referred to her, your grandmother, you know, you said she immigrated from Switzerland. She told stories about how she would hold these seances and psychic readings for the Swedish community, which you talked about. You, you frequented these seances. Um, how do you think that this early experience of actually being there and hearing the knocking on the table, um, I'm assuming you actually heard the knocking on the table from, from the dead, correct? Yeah. Um, and, and how do you think that those early experiences influenced who you have become today? Primarily, oh, well, let me just say at the starting point, what it did is that it, it, it produced in me a deep, deep curiosity 
about what is this animating principle we call life. And also a deep curiosity about what happens after death, because we're also talking to people that are gone and, and they're in a different form of some kind. And this animating principle became a place of focus for me in my meditation and my practice of martial arts and Aikido, where they're all based in really what we would call chi or ki. And that became like a really a, a magnetic pull, magnetic pull towards me. And that um, poured into my work, you know, as a somatic coach, as a somatic therapist, as a teacher, and also um, um, how do I get ready to be even more alive? How do, if I, well, get, if I you, get informed by spirit, what else will that add to my life? You know, you've been able to make a livelihood out of something, you know, given our ages, that back then, when you started all this, it wasn't that common. You know, you, you were... I'm not going to say a rebel, but you certainly were a change maker. Uh, you were bringing things to light that a lot of people um, weren't aware of. And I'm sure they were afraid of. Uh, many people, you know, dancing in this world for the first time, they have to get their feet wet. And, you know, you, you speak about your friend and you tell the story about your earache and fever. And you state that the earache became a cornerstone for the practice of using difficult situations to cultivate an awakened state. Um, can you speak with the listeners about your experience and how this helped you become one with your awakened state? Um, I remember reading this story about you walking home from school and then having this kind of like, I don't want to say out of body experience, but this headache, earache, um, lying down. And I remember reading the story and I'm going, wow, I wonder what was going on with him. And it went on for what sounded like in the book, a couple of days, right? Mm -hmm. um, so speak with us about it. And, uh, you know, how did this bring you to this awakened state? Because you said you were able to overcome the pain from it. You said the pain was excruciating. Um, but that you you were able to transmute that pain. The, tra the, the pain was excruciating and it felt like a dagger right in the middle of my head. Um, it lasted over time because there was some kind of flu or bacteria or virus in there. But as I was walking home, um, there was nobody at home and it was just me. And um, I'm... I'm in my young age trying to go, well, how do I manage this? What, what the hell is this anyway? And I think because of the influence of my grandmother, where I will skip back to this when there was some conversation around her table about there's a heaven and there's a hell. And she said, no, heaven and hell is inside of you. You make that. Mm -hmm. What an extraordinary thing to hear from somebody that I totally respected, maybe didn't understand but when she said it's inside of you and it's not like a place where there's all this fire and brimstone, but there's my actions will produce that. Anyway, that sent me inside of myself and I found this place inside of myself that could calm myself. I don't know if I transcended the pain, but it had a different effect on me. And it was like a place inside myself, I will call, like the Sufis will call, they, they will say this connection to the, the divine is the divine friend. So I use that word, this yar, but this, it was like somewhere, a space, a relationship that actually gave me tranquility and peace to a certain extent during this pain. It, is a, it was a fascinating story. I, 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 you know, again, for my listeners, reading the book and listening to this and reading the stories is a big part of this. And uh, I want to compliment you on telling stories and weaving them through there and how you came to that awakened state because you were able to, I'm going to call it, transmute that 
pain. Um, right? Right. Yeah. Exactly. And that's, it, so you found something within you. I know yesterday I did a podcast on entering the mind about Dochen meditation with mm -hmm. a guy. And I know that's a certain lineage and practice of Tibetan Buddhism that not everybody practiced. But again, it, it, it emphasizes to me what, oh, I don't want to call it, I'm going to say power we actually have over our bodies. Um, and obviously, a, being a master of Aikido, that's another one. Now, in the chapter embodying the practice, you, you talk about being bullied at 12 years old in school, and you were in pain, you were afraid. Um, you go on to state that without hesitation, that the path of Aikido and meditation helped you heal your rage that was kind of through the line from generation to generation of men in your family. So you're saying that it's there. What happened to you to heal the rage and what role did Aikido and meditation play in healing that rage? Because you, it's not like you weren't upset with these other little kids that were bullying you. Um, and you certainly had the ability to attack them. And I'm sure you did at some point. But <laughs> mm. Well, you know what? I, we, we moved, we moved every, every once a year, sometimes twice a year. Yeah. Your dad was in the military. So you guys moved a uh, lot. Yeah. Went all over, all over. And every time I was at a new, new place, it was a whole new school, new routes to get there. And, you know, there would be taunts and cat calls, which I could, I could handle. But if I was pushed, I would push back or I was shoved, I would shove back. Um, you know, I, my mother accused me of being a bully, but mostly I was like, I was quick to anger um, uh, and that I was, I was afraid. So I, that's what I did. Would I say I was afraid? No, you didn't do that. No. In those times. And so she said, God, what am I going to do with you? And she picked me up at school where I bloodied some kid's nose and I had a torn shirt and I had to go home. And the vice principal said, put him in judo. She freaked out, said he's going to learn how to fight more. And he says, no, he'll learn discipline. I went to this big Quonset hut, Navy Quonset hut, badminton going on, boxing going on, wrestling's going on, volleyball, and so forth. And there's this knot of men with these uniforms throwing each other down, getting up smiling and throwing the other guy down. And it looked like poetry to me. It looked, I, did, I never once thought, oh, now I'll be able to beat up Billy. I thought... As a grown-up, I look back and I go, that's poetry. And, you know, I trained in it. And all of a sudden, the, the pushes and shoves stopped. I don't think anybody knew I was doing judo or doing a combative martial art. But it must have been some way that I was walking differently. Or if they, if they pushed me, there was a way that I stood up to them. And in my presence, seemed to neutralize that aggression. Um, and then um, I went through karate, I went through jujitsu, and then I found Aikido 50 years ago this year. And I fell in love again. That was, that was in the island of Kauai. And um, I've been doing Aikido ever since. I teach Aikido. Um, the headquarters, Aikido headquarters of Japan awarded me the rank of Shihan, which means master teacher, which I'm I'm feel humble about and proud of, and I still have a teacher. And those things taught me the possibility of neutralizing somebody's aggression as right. opposed to neutralizing who they were. Well, Aikido, and I think a lot of my listeners know, but some might not know, it's when the energy is being pushed to you, you allow the energy to kind of flow through. So the way you move the people is to move the people kind of to your side. I've practiced a little bit. So you let that forceful energy and you, you move with it. You don't move against it, kind of move with it. And you, in essence, in the end, you kind of burn your oppo opponent out. If that's, if that's the way you want to talk about it. But um, it, it is a whole energy. When you say you carried yourself 
I think differently. I think you carried yourself with a newfound energy because when you, it, it, maybe the word is wrong, but I'll say, but when you kind of uh, take in all that energy uh, from a teacher and a master and you say you went back to school and you didn't get bullied anymore, I think it's because they recognized that there was a, a new person embodied in that body. Uh, and that's what happens. And you were encouraged to play sports and practice martial arts from an early age. You mentioned that these activities made you electric with purpose, is the way you say it. And you discovered a deep longing to find out what you were capable of. Um, how did you do these act? How did these activities lead to the doorway to more spacious consciousness? That's the chapter on spacious consciousness, because, you know, we're going to talk about, you know, you went to Mexico and you competed in some games and, you know, pre-Olympic, you called it pre-Olympic games, but you had some really, really good teachers along the way. I think that I, I could I could speak about these two things. One is that as you mentioned is 1966. I ran on the U.S. team for the pre-Olympic meet and the Central American Games, and um, we were at altitude about 8,000 feet, um, humid, and doing a lot of races. Um, I was just young, I'm like 21, and I'm being asked for autographs and being interviewed down there because. I was going toe to toe with our Mexican champion. And um, at one semifinal, it was in the 200 meters, I'm running it. And all of a sudden I I'm seeing myself run. Yeah. I'm seeing myself run. And now I'm, I think many of the readers might be familiar with out of body experiences. That was brand new for me. And um, I was shocked. And when I went, oh my God, boom, I'm back in my body. I'd won that heat, people came over to me and I saw that they didn't see me have that experience. And there really wasn't anybody to articulate that too. And my grandmother by that time had passed, although she crossed my mind and I said, I should talk to her about this. But in that moment, it opened up this, this notion of, oh, I'm out of this body and I'm really kind of in a new body. I'm out of this shape of living in another shape of living where it's really started to confirm even more deeply these things around watch the seances, for example. And then in an Aikido uh, moment, my teacher, my sensei was um, demonstrating me for a certain technique. He threw me very fast, very hard, and it had a spiral fracture in my arm. And I was in the middle of that fall. And all of a sudden I was up in the corner of the room watching it all again. Mm -hmm. Shocking. Boom, came back to my body, tried to do something, realized I couldn't realize that this arm was broken. But again, I had this opening into this other domains of consciousness. Well, and I think when you were doing the running, the way you wrote it in the book was, it was almost like you had endless energy, right? So you, you in essence, uh, had an out-of-body experience, kept going, won your heat, right? I don't know. Did you win? Did you win the pre-gold medal for the Olympic when you were down there, or what we, actually happened? We, we, I won the two hundred meters, tied in the tied in the hundred meters, and our relay team won. Oh my goodness! Well, great success story. And yes. you know, again, it leads the readers to understand these this out of body experience. You know, a lot of people have that, like, you know, they they get hit by a car, or they drown, or they do whatever, and they have these moments when they're being revived, and they've gone to the other side, and they come back, right? And call it the other side, if you will, call it whatever you want to call it. But those out-of-body experiences are very real. And when you look at the accounts of them, it's like people were not in pain. So it, it, it's like, well, I left my body and I saw the doctors working on me over the table. You know, you hear lots of that kind of stuff. You had a great teacher in your mid-20s, Professor Lalata. I hope I got that right. Lilita. Lilita. 
you told a great story about the lessons he was teaching you regarding relaxing and giving up and relinquishing. Uh, can you tell the story and what you ultimately learned considering it took you some time to come to the realization about the teachings? It wasn't like immediately, you know, this guy pulled your arm. I even remember the whole quote. And you're like, wow, I could tell that he was could do something really nasty to me if he needed to, right? Um, that was part of it. And he was getting something across, but it took you so long. I think it wasn't an eight years in between before you came to this realization of what he was trying to teach you. <laughs> Professor Lili Ta was an exemplary martial artist. And I got him to come over to Mill Valley and we trained with some other people in Pakwao, Chinese boxing and Tai Chi Chuan. And um, then I would go to San Francisco and train with him in a park with mostly other Chinese. And once, you know, he, he pulled me aside, was working with me. He was a little bit more stern with me that time. And um, at one point he, I couldn't do the technique on him and he pulled me aside and he said, um, uh, listen, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you a story. I want you to listen carefully. Looked at me really deeply. Um, I was a little bit concerned because, you know, sometimes he would do that and sweep my feet from under me or do a pressure point. And he started to tell me a story about a Chinese painter, calligrapher, philosopher in the sixth century named Wu Daozi. Yeah. And, and he said, at one point, the emperor asked him to do a calligraphy from all his travels. The legend goes he went to one end of the wall outside the emperor's residence and drew forest and mountains and streams and rivers. In succession. In succession, almost like he did it easily. And at the very end, he drew a picture of a grotto or a wave. This is, this is Mr. Lili Todd telling me this. And he said, when he drew that, he disappeared. He disappeared into the grotto. And then he says to me, <laughs> do you understand? And I felt terrible about it, but I said, I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and he said, he held up his finger and he says, listen, he disappeared in there. And he left, but his art remained. He says, do you understand now? You said no. I said, no, <laughs> no, I, no, I don't. And he kind of looked at me like a, like a teacher would look at kind of a, a, a dense student. And I thought he was disappointed, but then he patted me on the shoulders and he said, well, then relax these. And he patted me in my lower abdomen and he said, and breathe from here which by the way was good advice and I do it to my students and I still do it. But what I, over time, what I began to see and realize from studying in philosophy and meditation and taking some um, psychotropic plants was that he said, what Dogen said was to be on a path, Dogen the Chi Japanese Zen monk in the 13th century, to be on a path is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be one with all things. And that was like, oh, that's what happened to me in Mexico City. That's what happened to me when I was took some peyote or psilocybin mushrooms. That's what happened to me in deep meditation. And I went, oh, I could see these signposts on a path then. Did it get me right away? No, I'm, I'm not fully cooked. I'm still practicing and curious and doing all that. But how do we, as we would say in the West, let go of your ego? Well, it's it. the story that your master teacher taught you was a good one. And the, the fact that you came to the realization on, the, on your own journey, on your own time, uh, gave it much more significant meaning. And sometimes those things need to uh, bask for a while. They need to sit there for a while and us ruminate on them. We don't always get them right away. 
and I think for our readers and our listeners, um, it's okay. And I think the Buddha always said, you know, question what anyone ever gives you to read or study and come up with your own understanding of that, right? And and I think that is kind of where you are. You came up with your out-of-body experience and understanding of what it was. And that's what he was trying to get you to understand. Now, you speak about the incident of your life that you made this story with, you know, we talked about Mexico City and this pre-Olympics. But I think one of the questions we didn't answer from that is you had that out-of-body experience. But if you could speak about the experience as it relates to the listeners on states of consciousness, parallel universes, and the singularity of a unified field, because now we're getting quite a bit deeper than just your experience. We're talking about the, let's call it the science or the quantum physics behind the experience, which I was talking about this yesterday. Um, time is a construct that we've made up. <laughs> if everything is always happening at the same time in one, let's call it universe, obviously, uh, most people can't put their head around that. And I know that um, David Bohm, he actually taught for a while at Berkeley, right? Mm -hmm. um, but he really had a lot of influence from England is where he kind of ultimately ended up. But Bohm's teachings really are about, you know, we label things. We try and put it into categories. We do things because the construct we're trying to make up. And then when you start to talk about these states to conscious parallel universes and singularity of the unified field, it's a hard thing for people to grasp. Richard, how would you in your estimation, explain that to this listening audience? Well, I would say, um, and I think you referred to it, is that I had these experiences that opened up a domain in which there's something more than just my understanding or the way that I'm manufacturing reality. There's something bigger than that. Than that. It also, what also happened to me is that I was introduced some just exemplary teachers all the way from my grandmother to my spiritual teacher to um, some somatic teachers that were had these very powerful presences that I kept thinking, whatever they were doing, I'm really interested in who they are. Like I often said about my Capoeira teacher, that if he, I, he was a dishwasher and I met him, I would be washing dishes because that was the form was Capoeira. But all of those things basically opened up this notion that there's more. There's more than my, my optic. There's more than my identity, myself, and what I'm looking at. And um, then through in all of these teachers that I had, their discourse was based in, this is what we're, why we're here, our for sake of what? This is what we're looking for. Now we have to practice. So basically I've been in like many number of people, 50 years of practicing Aikido, more than more years than martial arts totally and in meditation. And it's through those, um, exp those, those practices that has opened me to and more receptive to the possibility of these other domains, which I would call divine or sacred. Well, you know, when I talked with George Leonard the last time we talked about it, we talked about the ITP, Integrative Transformative Practice. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And, you know, for those listeners out there that want to learn more about a practice that could lead to this, and I think you said your dojo is still hosting the ITP. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. In... Mm -hmm. um, in Marin. Yes. Right? So I'd encourage you to go to Richard's website because there's a lot there you can learn. You can also go to Petaluma and take classes. You can do all kinds of things. He's got, it's a very robust website um, and there's lots of offerings. There's a big staff and facility. It's not just Richard. 
Um, and that's the great thing is once Richard leaves the fiscal plane, there's going to be lots of people to carry on behind him here. Uh, you state that the embodied practice of moving the attention from thinking to feeling reside in a cellular medium in bone and in body, skin and electrical impulses, and driven by muscles to behave and act in the world, not from the conceptual knowledge of the disembodied mind. How does the power to direct our attention have the power to shape our brain's firing patterns? Because this is what you were kind of addressing in this part of the book. Yes. So, um, first of all, that I would hold that we have the, in the side of the spiritual longing that we may have, or this transformative longing that we may have, we hold it as an idea. We read about it. There's distinctions. And then it's an idea. It's a concept. It's a start. But most people, many people stay there. What we claim in somatics, in the work that I do, we say you need to move your attention from the thinking self to the feeling self. That doesn't mean I'm having a feeling or emotion. It means contacting that core animating energy that enlivens us, what we call spirit. So that when you contact spirit, it means then this thing that's always interested me, like I didn't want to go to a cave or a monastery. I didn't want to run a big company, but how do I embody that mystery while I'm in the world, while I'm raising children, doing the dishes and all of that? And it requires um, capturing the attention and then directing it. Energy, life follows attention. Choice follows awareness. The more aware we are, the more choice we are, the more choice we have. The more we, we direct our attention to places, that's where the energy is. So if we go to this shape, this is the doorway to life. We are able to contact more directly and immediately this notion that we're calling spirit or key. Well, in this process, you know, I, th I know there's this practice somatic breathing, right? And a lot of people practice that. Um, at your institute, uh, tell us a little bit, and then in the summary of this, uh, my questions here, a little bit about the institute and what you do. And then secondly, you know, the book is filled with these reflective questions uh, to get the reader to shift from the thinking to being one with their internal powers, how would you want to leave our listeners today regarding this embodiment of these untapped power and also what the Institute does? So it's like a two-part question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, really this notion that if we move our attention inside of ourselves we begin to see that there's a intelligence or a wisdom there that is actually 3 billion years old, is coming from the sea and to land, and we've evolved to this. And there's an inherent wisdom there, there's an inherent compassion there, and there's an inherent capacity for skillful action there. So that we can get the distinction by reading a book or hearing somebody, but we can go inside of ourselves and become, and become more receptive to those things that are already extant within ourselves. That really goes against the stream of what our consumer-oriented materialistic world is about, that we're gonna find better this or better that, or more youth or lifelong this for these things out side of us. Now, some of those things are good for sure. I'm not saying they're, they're not, or even critical, reasonable, rational thinking is, but we've atrophied the capacity for our conscience, intuition, for our spirit, our soul, if you will. So that's really what our work is about, that getting inside of this shape, we call it the soma, or the shape of our livingness, and feeling getting in contact with that core energy 
starts to make us much more receptive to a wisdom that is much bigger than the personality and a compassion that's much bigger than the personality as well as we then act more skillfully in the world. And that's what we teach at the Institute. You know, we, we, we have um, our mission is to help leaders, assist leaders in embodying pragmatic wisdom, grounded compassion and skillful action. Leaders could be you're leading your own life. You're in a transition. You're making choices inside this transition. It may be you lead the team. You lead the PTA. You lead a family. You lead a huge corporation. Or you lead a battalion of, 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 uh, of men and women, for example. So leader is, when we say leader, we mean every individual. It's just not, it's not a role. It's a way of being, to be in charge of your own life. We also do programs around trauma, healing trauma, resilience in somatics. And I have been really fortunate to have tremendous teachers in body work. And we have a form of body work called somatic, somatic body work that allows the body to become more free and more healed. So we are more receptive to these um, inherent capacities love, more love, greater contact, greater coordination, greater re reciprocity with others. Well, you know, your institute has been around for a long time. I think I was reading like mm, in the 60s? 1970, we formally began. It's 1970, so formally. Yes. Um, and you've done this for Fortune 500 companies, you've done it for nonprofits, you've done it for government, military. You've had hundreds and hundreds of people through this, probably thousands of people, thousands, thousands. thousands of people. And I wanna encourage my listeners to do go check out the website and I will put it up for you right now, strozzinstitute.com. That's where you wanna go. Also, this book will have a link to the book on Amazon. Um, it's been a pleasure having you on, Richard, and just kind of talking about your books, your stories, your life. I think that's as meaningful to our listeners as anything. Uh, and the fact that they can go out and, in this case, embodying the mystery, that's what it is, uh, somatic wisdom for emotional energetic and spiritual awakening. Uh, also, we'll put links to some of Richard's other books as well. So you can check those out too. Um, namaste to you and thank you for hanging out with me for 45 minutes and telling your stories and letting us just get an insight into you and the work that you're doing. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, it's been a pleasure.